Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 18. Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 18. You can see in your Bibles that uh, we're skipping Iconium for now. Um, That's uh, the sermon that Ramiro had prepared, so he'll preach it when he comes back. Uh, But for now, we're going to be in verses 8 through 18 of Acts 14. When Dr. Bookman came last Wednesday, one of the important lessons he was sharing with us was the difference between event revelation and word revelation. Do you guys remember this when he was speaking about this? The difference between event revelation and word revelation, that God has, uh, through events and through history, he has revealed himself, he's revealed his character, he's revealed uh, his actions and and what he's like um, through event revelation, but then he didn't leave it there. He didn't just do all these signs and wonders and leave it up to us to interpret. Instead, Uh, He recorded those events in word revelation, and he explained those events in word revelation. So he did not just do a miracle and then leave it uh, undescribed. Instead, he did the events, but then he also gave us word revelation to describe the events and to, to provide us with the truths and the doctrines that help us interpret and understand what he was doing in history. If we were to only read the event revelation and we didn't read the word revelation. Now, if we were only to pay attention to the events and not pay attention to what the prophets and the apostles say about the events, well, that's certainly going to lead us into error. Uh, As an example of that, a group who who does that frequently uh, is the faith healing movement. I don't know how much you've heard about them. The name it, claim it kind of prosperity gospel movement. In my opinion, that's one of the things they do. They look at verses like what we'll see in verses 9 and 10 of our text. Look at verses 9 and 10. Acts 14, verses 9. It uh, it says, He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. You know, I'm sure you've heard false teachers pounce on a narrative like this. uh, Because to them, this is how they can get away with saying that they're faith healers. But then people aren't being healed. Well, it must be because the person didn't have faith to be made well. Rather than letting the scriptures command us and, and explain the truth, they take the narrative and they start to make their own set of commands and truths around it. Uh, listen to some of the things they, they say. They say, if you have enough faith as a believer, then you never need to be sick. Uh, the true saint will always be healed. <clears throat> if you are not healed, then the problem is you. You must not have enough faith. A true believer would be healed. The problem is that you must really believe. You must claim this healing for yourself and then you'll be healed. Have you ever heard language like that before? Now, a lot of times they'll add to it, you know, oh, by the way, you can show that faith and you can increase that faith by giving us every last penny. Uh, And the more you give us, the more your faith is going to increase. And and the Lord is just waiting to multiply your money back to you and waiting to heal you. All you have to do is give every single dollar you own to this ministry. Of course, you hear things like that. Uh, but they interpret the narratives without reading the rest of the apostles' words. Listen to, to an example. This is Gloria Copeland. Have you ever heard of this false teacher? Gloria Copeland. This is, uh, these are direct quotes uh, from a message from her. She says, We must take healing like a dog takes a bone. He clamps down hard on that bone and refuses to turn loose of it. The fact is, you haven't really prayed in faith if you pray about something, but don't take it. That's what she says. Be relentless. Take it by by force. Uh, See yourself taking your healing when you pray. See yourself in perfect health. Take it by faith and hold on to it. And when you take it, you have it. Healing belongs to you and to me. If you need healing, take it. Take it with your faith and with your words. Believe you receive it and don't waver. That's the message as they turn to the narratives, but then don't let the apostles explain the narratives. I don't know how you sync those claims up, how you, how you harmonize those claims with Jesus' model of prayer in Gethsemane. 
where he prays, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That doesn't sound like taking something by force, believing that we have it. I don't know how they sync those statements with Paul's thorn in the flesh or Paul leaving Trophimus ill at Miletus uh, or other infirmities that we see in the faithful. You know, maybe they say that Paul and Jesus don't have enough faith uh, or something like that. Uh, Kosti Hinn uh, wrote a book called God, Greed, in the Gospel. Uh, Kosti Hinn is the nephew of Benny Hinn, another one of these false teachers. Um, Kosti Hinn was saved out of that movement, and, and the way he describes it is that those movements, they overcomplicate faith. They make it something that it's not. Listen to what he says. This is a quote from his book. He says, faith isn't giving money to get his love. Faith isn't paying a fee for his saving grace. Faith isn't going broke to get healed. Faith isn't traveling to a special service to receive his anointing. Faith is repenting of your sins and turning to him, believing that he is the son of God. Any religion, that teach, any religion teaching that you need to do good works, give enough money, or speak enough positive declarations to unlock God's saving grace or abundant blessings on your life is a false religion. Christian faith is believing in Jesus Christ for eternal life and experiencing the joy, freedom, and blessing of knowing Christ for free. He finishes saying this, the prosperity gospel turns faith into a works-based system and confuses it by adding burdens that people cannot carry. I'd agree with everything he said. These teachers desire the miracles and the attention that they see in the narratives. And so they've constructed this body of truth around it. Rather than relying on the commands that we've received, and we've received plenty from the mouth of Jesus and his apostles, rather than relying on those commands and letting that be the content of their teaching, they formed a new body of doctrine around the narratives that they've read. We don't need to do this. Um, God explains his own truth. He's given us the event revelation and he's given us the word revelation. And he's been very clear about it. Uh, he's given us true commands and they don't sound the same as the false faith healer uh, commands. Well, in our passage today, we're going to see another crowd uh, that misinterprets an event. But Paul is going to work really hard right away to clear up any misunderstanding that could, be, that could happen. He explains the event revelation with word revelation as an apostle. And so as we step through this passage, um, uh, we'll see three corrections. That's our outline for today. Again, it's, it's on the website if you can find it. Um, it's different than what's in your bulletin. But our outline for today is three corrections for a confused crowd. Three corrections for a confused crowd. It's God is powerful, God is living, and God is good. Three corrections for a confused crowd. God is powerful, God is living, and God is good. So follow along. It's a little bit longer text, but I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 18. Luke writes, Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus. And Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things. To a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without, without witness. 
For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Pray with me before we begin. Father, as we read this new narrative in a new city, I pray that you would help us have the discernment to pay attention to what your word says. Help us not stray away from your word. Instead, help us pay attention to how Paul uses this occasion to give you glory. To share good news with the people there. We pray, Father, that you would give us that same passion. uh, That when people mistakenly give us glory, that we could be people who are quick to give you glory instead. We pray for your help as we study this passage together. We pray that you'd help us read and understand. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, first we see that God is powerful, and that's going to be in verses 8 through 13. Uh, So Paul preached in Antioch of Pisidia, and then he was chased off. That's where we just ended. Uh, Next, he would go to Iconium. That's what Ramiro is going to preach when he comes back. Well, now he's at Lystra. He had been chased off from Antioch, chased off from Iconium. Now he's at Lystra, uh, and he's preaching the gospel there. And we meet this man in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. So this is not a man who was temporarily injured. Uh, This is not a man that just uh, twisted his ankle or or something like that. This was a man who had never, from birth, never been able to walk. Um, He's crippled so that he's never been able to use his feet. But uh, he hears Paul preaching the gospel, verse 9. It says that he listened to Paul speaking. So this man uh, was hearing Paul preach the good news. And he was listening to Paul, and he believed. He had faith. And this is what Paul notices. So look at verse 9. It says, he listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. It's similar to to a miracle we've seen already in the book of Acts. We've seen this kind of thing happen uh, already. Uh, We know from the rest of the scriptures that Miracles like this happen in in a variety of contexts. Uh, Sometimes it is because of the person's faith, and Jesus will commend somebody for their faith, uh, and he'll make it very clear uh, that this was possible because they believed. Other times, the person who's healed is doubting, uh, maybe even strongly doubting, that they're not people of faith. So I don't think that we're supposed to read these narratives and make conclusions about the strength of faith required for healing, like the faith healers do. I don't think that's the point. Instead, I think uh, each time there is a miracle, we're to view it as a decisive act of a sovereign God who is doing something uh, among his people. Uh, Sometimes this is in a response to a cry, a desperate cry of dependent trust to the Lord. Sometimes uh, these miracles are, are done in response to a quiet prayer offered up by the individual. Uh, Sometimes it is in response to the quiet prayer of someone else, that someone else prays uh, for this person and they're healed. Sometimes uh, it's in response to a loud request, out loud request uh, from Jesus or the apostles, and then a miracle happens. But every time it's a decisive act of a sovereign God who is testifying to his gospel, testifying to the truth of his word. This time is no different. Uh, Paul can see something about this man. Maybe he he sees the look in his eyes. Maybe he he sees that this man is really listening. Uh, And not just listening, but he's been cut to the core by the gospel. And he's he's begun to believe. Maybe he's trusting Paul. Paul can see something, that there is this uh, dependence on God. There is faith. There is belief there. And so Paul adds that observation to what he knows God has been doing through the hands of the apostles over and over as he testifies to the truth of his word. And he's confident that if Paul gives the command for him to stand up, that God will heal him um, and that the man will be able to stand up. 
um, more than able to stand up, he actually springs up, right? Just like we've seen before in the book of Acts. He springs up and begins to walk around. Now, for the crowds that weren't listening that closely, uh, they don't seem to have been listening to the gospel that Paul was preaching, uh, at least not paying attention to the actual words. Because when they see this, and they see the man spring up, and they see him walking around, they begin to speak about it in their local language. So look at verse 11. It says, When the crowd saw <clears throat> what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Uh, So for some reason, uh, for a while, Paul and Barnabas are unaware of what's happening. Uh, Maybe it's because they're teaching in a synagogue or something, and uh, the man's healed kind of on the edge of the synagogue, and then the people are outside, and they get all excited about it, and they're going to come and surprise the gods uh, with these sacrifices, and so Paul and Barnabas just have no idea what's going on. Uh, It also says that they were specifically speaking Lyconian. Uh, and so maybe that's the reason why Paul and Barnabas didn't know what was going on. That as they're, as they're discussing this theology of these gods who have come to heal them, um, that they're doing it in their local language. Remember, Paul would have been speaking in Greek, the universal language at this time. Um, <clears throat> just like if you go and do business overseas, probably you're going to speak English, right? That's uh, the language that most people would speak as they're in an international context. That doesn't mean that they don't also have their own language. So that's what we see happening here is they're speaking in their local language um, and Paul and Barnabas are are unaware until they finally hear what's taking place, that these oxen have come and the garlands have come uh, and and they run out to correct them. In the meantime, uh, the people had already formed this whole body of truth to interpret this event. Uh, They have already formed this whole uh, doctrine about who Paul and Barnabas are, and they've even got this parade ready, you know, and they're ready for sacrifices. You can see that they just vastly misinterpret what happens. The father of the Greek gods, Zeus, uh, has visited them with his son and communicator, Hermes. Uh, Paul must be Hermes because he's the one speaking, and Zeus wouldn't do that, and so they assume Barnabas is the greater one because he's not the one speaking. Uh, So they've got the oxen ready. They have the garlands prepared. They're ready to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, who they think are Zeus and Hermes. There are stories about this in their history that that sometimes the the Greeks and Romans have missed opportunities to sacrifice to gods in human form. So I think, you know, they just don't want to miss their opportunity. Paul and Barnabas will barely be able to restrain them. You know, this, this act that God does as he steps into human history and as he heals this man that had been crippled and couldn't walk. It's so stunning. It's so uh, marvelous and and immediately arresting that they think that the people who do this must be gods. But they don't know the half of God's power. Uh, God does not need to be present to heal You remember the story of of Jesus with the centurion and how Jesus didn't have to go there. He only had to say the word and his servant would be healed. Uh, In the same way, God does not have to be present to to heal and God was working through one of his servants as he testified to their message, testifying that the good news is true, testifying that Paul and Barnabas were messengers sent by him. This crippled man believed in a true God. And Paul believed in the true God. But it wasn't either one of them that accomplished this miracle. It was God working through one to heal the other. These people that see this are underestimating God's power. God is more powerful than they even thought. The problem with the false teachers and the name it, claim it movement Uh, at least a problem, is that they are so man-centered. You know, it becomes so much about uh, how strong your faith is, what you can accomplish through your faith, what you can take hold of and grab onto. 
As they read a passage like this, they, they turn right to man and they see what tricks they could pull out of this passage, what they could accomplish if they just believe it enough, rather than recognizing that a sovereign God was working out his own purposes, testifying to his apostles, testifying to his word. Well, the confused crowd here makes a similar mistake, right? They immediately turn to the men who this miracle was accomplished through, not recognizing that those men were speaking about the true God, not listening to their words, that they weren't glorifying themselves, that they hadn't come to visit as gods. They were speaking about the true God, the living God, the powerful God. It is God who is powerful, not man. So Paul corrects, is, is going to continue to correct them on this mistake as he corrects the other mistakes. But let's go to uh, the second correction, is that God is living. These other idols, Zeus and Hermes and, and the other uh, gods and their pantheon, they are empty and worthless. They're vain. But God is living and active. Look at verses 14 and 15. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So Paul and Barnabas have a strong, strong reaction to this. They are not going to let this stand. They rip their clothes. They rush to stop this. Uh, there's not a moment, it seems, where they, they seem to consider taking this glory for themselves. Uh, there's not a moment where Paul pauses them and says, hey, you've got this wrong. You thought that Barnabas was the, the leader here. Let me assure you, it's actually me. I'm the leader here. You know, there's nothing. They're not concerned with their own glory at all. They don't want to take this glory for themselves because they have a mission, and their mission is that God be glorified and that these people hear about the true God. Anything else is going to just be confusion. And so they, they work hard immediately. <clears throat> this is horrifying to them. It distracts from the truth. So they begin correcting. They say, we also are men. We are of the same nature of you, as you. We're just like you. You know, we're men. We're not gods. Instead, Paul says, we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So not only are we not those gods, uh, but also those gods are fake. They're vain. They're empty. They're worthless. What we are calling you to do, what the apostles are calling them to do, is to turn from those empty things, those worthless things, and turn to the living God. There is a real creator there is one being, not a pantheon, there is one being who made the sky, and he made the earth, and he made the sea, and he made everything in the sky, and he made everything on the earth, and he made everything in the sea. He's active, he's creative, he's powerful, and he's alive, he's living. And so Paul is inviting them to turn to the living God. They have allowed themselves to be deceived. They know that their hands made these things. They know that these, this pantheon is the invention of man. Uh, they know that these are good luck charms that they're turning to. They also know that there must be a creator, that creation declares the glory of God. They know all this. And Paul is inviting them to leave that behind and turn to the true God. But... Paul makes it clear that uh, they don't get to do both, right? Uh, the word he uses is the word for turn. He doesn't give them an option of, that's great that you think there's this pantheon. Let me add to it with the true God. That's not what he says, right? Uh, he tells them to turn away from those things and turn to the living God. There's a repentance there. There's a turning there. And this is consistently the call in every generation, and it's a call for you. Uh, I know you probably don't worship Greek and Roman gods, uh, but if you're an unbeliever, then you have spent your life chasing vain, empty, worthless things. And the call for you is to turn from those things and turn to the God who made you.
Turn to the living and active creator to abandon your worthless pursuits and turn to the living God. The invitation is still open. The invitation that Paul is giving them as he shares the good news with them, the invitation is still open to anyone who would believe in the true God. And if you reject it, uh, you will be held accountable. Uh, You'll be held accountable because you chose the useless pursuits of pleasure and vanity and emptiness. You chose those, uh, even though you've heard the call to turn to your creator. Paul's message that God is that God is living. He's active. He's the creator. He's paying attention to you, and you're accountable to him. Well, a third message for a confused crowd is that God is good. Look at verses 16 and 17. Paul says, In past generations he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So look at verse 16 first. He says, In past generations he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. What does he mean by that? Does he mean something like uh, it was okay in the past for people to worship idols, but now it's changed and it's not okay? Uh, does he mean that uh, in the Old Testament, God had revealed to the Jews that they needed to worship Yahweh, but it was okay for the nations uh, to go their own way, but now that Jesus has come, all of us are called to worship Yahweh? That certainly wouldn't line up with the rest of Scriptures, right? Right? there's a consistent testimony of the scriptures in every generation that they knew that there is a creator and that idolatry was always wrong and the gods that they invented were were always a mistake, always a sin to invent them and to worship them and to bow down to them. So I don't think that's what he's saying. Instead, I think what he's saying is he's speaking of God's sovereignty and goodness again. That yes, life has been good for them in different seasons, But it's not because of their idols. God had allowed them to go after those idols, and he didn't punish them immediately. Life was still good. But that goodness didn't come because they worshiped those idols. It was always God that was good. It was always him that was allowing these good things to come into their lives, even when they were rebelling against him. But the whole time, verse 17, he didn't leave them without a witness. Look at verse 17. He says, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So they may have allowed themselves to believe that the things that they created with their own hands were the things that created them. Uh, They may have allowed themselves to believe that these idols that they need to move around and provide for are the things that are providing for them the rain and the seasons and the harvest. They may have allowed themselves to be deceived in that way, but all along it was always God that was the true provider, even when they were worshiping the things that their hands had made. It is God who provides every good gift. Uh, In fact, uh, the good God, the true God, the living God, has promised that this would be so. Uh, Do you remember after Noah, after the the ark, after the floods? uh, God in his goodness made this promise to Noah. He said, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Never will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. It's from Genesis 8. God has set up these patterns that the seasons would continue because that's what brings these rains. That's what brings these crops. That's what provides for the people. Now, all that time, those events are subject to misinterpretation by the Gentiles, right? Uh, that all that time they might have just sacrificed to some idol and then rain did come because the Lord and his goodness provided rain. And they might credit that goodness 
to an idol instead of the Lord. They were wrong about this over and over and over. Seasons came and went. Rain came and went. Harvest came and went. There was much to be satisfied, but it was always the true God who was providing this regularity, always the true God who was providing these seasons and this goodness, this satisfaction for them. It's God who provides. Well, this goodness and kindness comes with a responsibility, and I think that's part of what Paul is getting at when he says that he did not leave himself without a witness. That this goodness in creation is what should have caused them to understand that there is a creator and caused them to be thankful and seek to know who that creator was. Uh, We have similar language in Romans 1. This is, I'm going to read to you verses 19 through 21. This is Romans 1. He says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. We have similar language in the Psalms, right? Creation declares the glory of God day-to-day pours out speech. That as people see creation, there is no excuse. That's what Paul says in Romans. They are without excuse. They were meant to see these things and turn to the living God and honor him and give him thanks. And instead, they allowed themselves to turn away, turn to idols and be darkened. The Gentiles may not have known as much as the Israelites They may not have been students of the Old Testament scriptures like the Israelites were, but they knew enough. They knew enough to know that there is a creator and that they are responsible to honor him and that they ought to give him thanks, ought to give him honor. Again, the same responsibility falls on you as an individual, each of us. Just as you are are responsible to turn to God, like we saw in the last point, turn away from vain things, turn to the living God, uh, so you are responsible to honor him and give thanks. The scriptures have made this clear. This is a responsibility for you, and you need mercy and grace. You need God's mercy and grace and forgiveness for all the times that you haven't done this. But the God who is all-powerful, and living and full of goodness, he has been unspeakably good in that he's provided us with a Savior. He's provided us with a way to be forgiven for all the times that we didn't honor him or give thanks as we should have. Jesus Christ has come, a gift from God and God's goodness, to die on the cross so that our penalty could be paid, so that we could be forgiven showing God's power, showing that God is living and active, showing that God is good. He's provided a way for us to be saved. If you're an unbeliever, you need to turn from worthless things and turn to the good God, the living God, who's provided this way for your forgiveness. If you're a believer, you get to rejoice already, right? You've seen all the things that are in our outline today. God is powerful, God is living, God is good. You've seen all of those things in your life. You've seen the power of God. You know that he can accomplish anything. You know that he's provided for you. You know that he's set up these seasons uh, and rains and and provided so many good things for you. He doesn't need to be physically present with you to answer your prayer. Uh, He's more powerful than that. You've seen that he's living and active in your life. You've seen that he's provided for you every day. Uh, You've seen that he changed your heart uh, even when you were dead in your trespasses, that he's put his spirit within you, causing you to desire right things, convicting you of sin. You've seen his goodness. He's been unceasingly good to you, uh, and he always will be. Uh, Unceasingly good to you every day of your life. So many things for you to enjoy, and, and in the life to come, he has definite plans to show you the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
That's Ephesians 2, 7. That he plans to show you the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He is good. He is unceasingly good to us. God is powerful. God is living. God is good. We'll look at verse 18. Our our story concludes uh, in verse 18. It says, even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. So even after all that Paul said, as he rushes out into the crowd, as he yells at them to please stop these sacrifices, as he pleads with them to see that he is just a man and he's just like them and he's of like nature with them. Uh, Even after all of that, they can hardly keep them from sacrificing. But you know that they were giving it their best shot. Uh, I think there must have been more to this story, right? This is a chaotic thing. Uh, You know that they were giving it their best shot. They didn't secretly love the attention they were getting. Uh, They didn't secretly cherish this glory that they were receiving as they had big smiles on because they loved all the attention. They loved the gifts that they were receiving. None of that. Instead, they wanted the truth to be understood. They wanted God to get all the glory. Uh, Just again, you know, I know I'm a broken record on this, but again, this is just another huge difference um, between them and the false teachers in this faith healing movement. That the people in the name it, claim it movement, they are eager to heap the glory on themselves, to heap the riches on themselves, but not Paul. Uh, you know, he is eager to give all the glory to God. He's eager to work with his hands. Uh, he's eager to do whatever he can to help people understand the truth of the gospel, to draw people's minds to the Lord instead of to himself. The false teachers want you to focus on man. They want you to unlock your potential and grab on to blessings by faith. <clears throat> they overcomplicate faith, and they crush souls that are suffering. They make the miracles about the healed instead of about the healer. They want to focus on man, and they want you to focus on man, but not Paul. Paul wants you to focus on God, the true God, the living God. He wants you to understand the true good news. He wants you to worship the one who is worthy of worship, whether he's performed a miracle in your life or not. Now, this doesn't mean that Paul has forgotten man. I think you can see in this passage how different this was than what we just went through in Antioch of Pisidia. For the Jews in the synagogue there, you saw him go through the Old Testament. Then you saw him explain the the facts of the gospel, and then you saw him prove those things, again with the Old Testament, using the scriptures to speak to these Jews. Um, This is a small example, a chaotic example example in Lystra. We'll see a fuller example in um, Athens. Uh, But you can see already that he's speaking differently to them, that he's going based off of what they know, about creation, what they have seen, if they haven't interacted with the Old Testament scriptures yet. Uh, Later, we'll hear Paul say this. This is from 1 Corinthians. He says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. So we know that this is a strategy of Paul to be kind to those by paying attention to who they are so that He can get them to understand the message of the true gospel. He doesn't totally forget about man. But his goal is not to glorify himself or glorify man or cause them to look at themselves. His goal in all of those things is to get them to look to the Lord for salvation, to listen to the good news and glorify the God of Scripture. His goal is to get them to look at the one who is worthy of worship, the one who is powerful and living and good, receive the forgiveness that he offers. Pray with me. Father, I pray that you would give us the same goal, the same earnest desire. As we interpret the times where you have stepped into human history, and accomplished miracles, and worked through the hands of the prophets and the apostles. I pray, Father, that you would guard us from the error of making up our own commands and truths around those events. 
Instead, help us be people that humble ourselves to listen to the prophets and the apostles, listen to the commands that they give, listen to the descriptions that they give. Father, help our minds be drawn to you and your glory and your forgiveness, your grace and your mercy, your goodness and kindness. Help our eyes not be so drawn to ourselves, what we can do, what we can accomplish, what we can earn, what we can be blessed with. Help us love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. We thank you for the humility of the apostles here, so eager to clarify. I pray, Father, that you'd give us that same eagerness eagerness to give you all the glory, to praise you for all that you've done in creation and in salvation, every good gift you've given us. Help us sing and praise and worship and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.